Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 53. After Hours with Jake Greffenstedt. Welcome, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast where Matt, Andrew, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we're eavesdropping on the correspondence of a senior demon, Screwtape, as he explains how to tempt the patient, a human assigned to be tempted by Screwtape's nephew, Wormwood. Each week, we'll be considering a different letter, untwisting Screwtape's hellish logic, and forming a battle plan for our own spiritual lives. However, today is a Thursday, which means it's an after-hours episode, and we're currently in Barfield month, which means today we're talking to another Owen Barfield scholar, Jake Greffenstedt. Originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Jake Greffenstedt has studied theology, philosophy, and literature at the universities of Notre Dame, Chicago, Beijing, Oxford, and now Cambridge, where he is working towards his PhD as a member of King's College. At Cambridge, Jake studies the legacy of Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 20th century thinkers like Owen Barfield, working at the intersection of theology and literature. Jake is also interested in the broader legacy of the Romantic tradition in Chinese poets like, and I'm going to mispronounce all of these, uh, Shu Jimo, Haji, and Ji Shang. Outside of his thesis, Jake is involved in the study and practice of film, even holding a special thanks film credit on the extended cut of The Tree of Life. During his free time in Cambridge, he shoots and develops expired film stocks with his wife, Christina. Nearly all photographic efforts spotlight their dog, Frodo Waggins. Jake Greffenstedt, welcome to Pints with Jack. Hi, David. Thank you so much for having me. So how did I do with the pronunciation of the names of those Chinese poets? Uh, you, you nailed it, yeah. Uh, and actually, I, I've just looked at some of the Chinese translations of, of Lewis's works. Um, screw tape is, is great. It's uh, D-U Lai Hong, or literally Letters from Hell. Oh, that's so yeah. cool. <laughs> all, all the translated titles are amazing. Well, that's good, because honestly, I think Lewis, although he's uh, a literary genius, he was not good at choosing book names, particularly <laughs> when I hear all of the names that he was trying to get for, particularly the Chronicles of Narnia. It's like, ugh, that's not good. <laughs> it piques your attention. You hear, I remember hearing Lion, Witch in the Wardrobe for the first time as a kid and thinking, what what the heck is going on there? <laughs> so your name was first given to me by Owen Barfield, the Inkling's grandson. And when I sent my co-hosts an outline of Barfield Month, my co-host Matt Bush told me that the two of you know each other. Yes. Uh, first, o- Owen is a, a wonderful person doing uh, great work uh, on behalf of his grandfather's legacy and, and right, uh, Small World. Christina, my wife, worked with Matt in a student business organization at Notre Dame during undergrad. Christy took over Matt's role after he graduated. And for my part, I followed Matt's footsteps in doing Notre Dame's year abroad program at Oxford a few years after him. Oh, wonderful. As you say, small world. (laughs) Now, before we get going, I have to ask, how did you manage to get a special thanks on the movie The Tree of Life? Uh, Just pure luck. I've always loved Terry's work. Uh, I was in Austin one summer working on a short film with one of his editors uh, and had the opportunity to offer some notes on um, some some cut edits. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> Jealous. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about your background shortly, but first to business, the quote of the week is probably one of my favorite quotations of Barfield's, and it comes from History in English Words. There is no surer or more illuminating way of reading a man's character, and perhaps a little of his past history, than by observing the context in which he prefers to use certain words. And it's early in the morning here in California, and you are in England. And actually, at like 3 a.m. this morning, I woke up and suddenly had a, a thought that, wait, has England changed their clocks yet? Because we've changed our clocks uh, for uh, to fall back here in California. And I had a suspicion that England hadn't done it yet, which meant that we were going to be an hour off. And in an hour, I'm going to my new godson's baptism. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So... It's early in the morning here. It's late at night in England. Uh, So I'm just drinking some chrysanthemum tea to ease me into the day. Uh, Are you drinking anything? Well, it's the proverbial 5 p.m. in Cambridge. So I'm drinking Bushmills as a nod to Lewis's Northern Irish roots. Well, excellent stuff. Well, cheers. Cheers. So to kick things off, when were you first introduced to the Inklings in general and Owen Barfield in particular? 
Well, I grew up in a Catholic household where Lewis and Tolkien were bookshelf staples. And as is not uncommon in answers to this question, my exposure to Barfield came much later on. I, I'm, I'm eager to one day meet someone who's read Barfield before Lewis, but um, we'll see in, in a decade or two. Uh, it sounds like tourist postcard fodder, but my first serious introduction to Barfield was over pints with some friends uh, and some fortuitously knowledgeable strangers at the Eagle and Child pub of Inkling fame. So really, I was, I was lucky enough to come into the orbit of some Barfield proselytizers in Oxford. I kept up an interest in him for a few years, but it's really been here at Cambridge that I've been able to do more focused work. And it's a great place for it. Despite his Oxford origins, Barfield has garnered a pretty sizable following in what's called the other place. <laughs> Yes, that's Cambridge for people that don't understand uh, university politics in England. It's funny, at the time of recording this, a podcast has just been launched called The C.S. Lewis Podcast. Uh, but in our household, we call it The Other C.S. Lewis Podcast. <laughs> the other podcast. That's great. <laughs> okay, so you were introduced to Barfield. What was it that particularly caught your attention? Because I'm going to say this, he is not the most accessible guy. Yeah, yeah, it was um, it was the text poetic diction for me. Um, I, I work in the wheelhouse of theology and literature, or religion and literature, as it's more often styled uh, in U.S. universities, which is an academic discipline generally defined by one or two accounts of what it purports to be doing. Um, the weak version sees literature as just a kind of vessel for an extractable theology that you can airlift out. Uh, the stronger account sees a more complicated relationship between the two, thinking of ways that you can have a theology that's irreducibly tied up in forms of narrative and the experiences of literature. And uh, Barfield, especially in texts like Poetic Diction, is exactly this latter kind of thinker. Uh, this was especially exciting to me because although Barfield really isn't, and I'll say isn't yet on the radar of most practitioners of theology and literature, uh, he clearly has a lot to bring to the conversation. Um, Lewis recognized this, and he seems only just on the cusp of gaining its, his due recognition. Uh, so I'm predicting a swell in Barfield readership in the coming decade. I think so too. The more I've dug into him, the more that I think that there is some stuff there still untapped. And the timing of Barfield Month was quite fortuitous because we had uh, Michael Jehoski on the show mm. and he, his big thing is about myth being incarnational, which to me seems very tied up with Barfield and ideas about what words carry with them mm. and the idea that the form of a text communicates something as well as what the words themselves represent. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's sort of right, right in my wheelhouse of, of what I'm interested in. <laughs> so in our first week of Barfield Month... Barfield's grandson, he gave us a, a very broad overview of his grandfather's life and spoke about a few of his works. And today I was really hoping that we could do a bit of a deeper dive into Barfield's writings. So when we were talking about this before, you said, all right, let's talk about literature and his poetry. So let's start with literature. What did he write? Of course, um, I'll talk through two timelines, kind of go through once and then, and then come back, uh, first covering the critical works and then um, back through to do the um, imaginative trajectory. Uh, Barfield wrote prolific prolifically, so I'm necessarily leaving out a lot of important texts. But I'll say by way of prolepsis that uh, a more complete survey of Barfield's work are accessible at owenbarfield.org, uh, which I'll flag as a as a great resource. But in any case, for the for the critical timeline, I think we should start with the text I just mentioned, uh, poetic diction. This is really chronologically Barfield's third book, published 1928, but the bulk of it was written earlier during his studies at Oxford. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable text which stages an innovative history of metaphor and poetic language. Um, one of the many things he speaks about is a, a fallacy, he thinks, in linguistics that sees language as becoming increasingly metaphorical and therefore for him poetical over time. So we once had the word wind, which was, on this fallacious count, merely a name for a thing. We had the word I, which was also merely the name for a thing. And we eventually get the metaphorical word window from wind I, which is richer than the sum of its parts by virtue of some emergent poetic meaning. But Barfield sees a problem with this kind of linguistic theory, 
uh, because it kind of pushes back towards some supposedly unmetaphorical time. Uh, and he says that even though today nearly all of our inherited language is in that way metaphorical, uh, we're by no means better poets than Homer. To the contrary, Homer has said everything there is to say, has said it best. So what is it about the nature of, of metaphor and language in Homer that's so moving? Barfield describes uh, what he calls a meaning still suffused with myth and Homer, um, with nature all alive in the thinking, such that, uh, he says, the gods are never far below the surface of Homer's language. The locus classicus here is, is the idea of breath uh, inextricably as a spirit. And his notions of participation come into play here. Uh, but I, I know you're covering that uh, idea in greater depth in, in other episodes. In any case, as interesting as poetic diction is, it wasn't really widely read until the latter half of the 20th century. Uh, though it was, of course, hugely impactful for Lewis and f- perhaps to a less obvious extent, Tolkien, as well as some other important players in 20th century literary theory. Uh, there's a story that Lewis would quote poetic diction at Oxford so frequently that it became a joke amongst his students. And apparently, as Barfield relates, many of these students held that Owen Barfield was uh, he says, quote, simply a name invented by Lewis when he wanted to put forward some idea he didn't want to take full responsibility for. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives you a, a sense of which uh, and the way in which even though Lewis disagreed with so much that Barfield said he was, he was really his, his greatest advocate. But in Poetic Diction, Barfield speaks of a regrettable lack of what he calls a poetic history of, of mankind. And this is really what he seeks to deliver in the 1926 History in English Words, uh, the source of your great quote of the day. It's a daring and experimental text, which attempts just what it says. Right? We might think that the, the preposition is a little surprising. History of English words, sure, but uh, uh, in means to trace English history through words, back through Germanic and for him, Greek and Latin and Sanskrit to some theoretical indo European language uh, in order to speculate about the about history generally and uh, more specifically the history of human consciousness. Uh, it's a wild read because while Barfield hedges up front his position as being wholly contingent on the advances of contemporary philology, uh, he's nevertheless willing to draw out some fascinating and we'll say daring implications about philosophy and, and religion generally. Uh, he speaks of words as being sort of like wine bottles uncorked, and he had this whole <laughs> <laughs> history coming from them. I heard the description of words as like a fossil record of human consciousness. And when I first heard that idea, it definitely caught my imagination, and I could see that that could certainly be examined more deeply. I'm always still a little bit suspicious as to quite how far you can push that, mm. but it's a fascinating idea. Precisely. And it's it's interesting because you speak to sort of proper theorists of language and or philologists. And there are so many people who are willing to, uh, despite disagreeing with Barfield completely, willing to entertain his ideas just for its sort of literary theoretical uh, value. Uh, After he finishes history in English words, there's a bit of a gap in his critical writing. He moves to London, becomes a solicitor. In 1957, we come to Saving the Appearances, a study on idolatry which many, including Barfield himself, consider his great mature work. I know this is a work covered in more depth in other episodes of this podcast, so I'll just note that this may be a worthwhile read for anyone interested in Lewis's discarded image, but uh, really a fantastic text. And you'll notice there's a big gap between these two, writing these two early texts in the late 20s and then saving the appearances in 57. Uh, Barfield had moved to London, became a solicitor, and had sort of taken a, a break from writing. Uh, he, he certainly did write in between, and there's a lot of unpublished writing uh, with Lewis. Uh, they corresponded specifically uh, about what they called fondly uh, the great debate, or the, the great war, rather, uh, over ideas of, of meaning, truth, and, and imagination. And there are some uh, volumes that have, have collected those. But he, he really starts writing again in, in earnest after saving the appearances, eventually moves to the U.S., and a lot of his later works are, are collections of his lectures during this time. So that's the case for Speaker's Meaning, uh, 1967, which distills and develops some key, key ideas from poetic diction and history in English words. There's a sense in which he felt like he was sort of misunderstood. So spe- Speaker's Meaning is, is really recapitulating a lot of what went before. The next 
I think really exciting thing that comes is is 1971. Barfield wrote a book called What Coleridge Thought, which is a central piece of my thesis at Cambridge. Barfield's reading of Coleridge as poet and philosopher is unique and sort of radical. But the thing I appreciate the t- about the text is the way Barfield takes Coleridge seriously as a Christian poet who thinks theologically through literature. This is in opposition to histories of reading Coleridge as a, a failed poet or a self-repressive, you know, heterodox pantheist who peppers Christianity into his verse only as a means of toting to orthodoxy. And this book has been influential for some great modern readers of Coleridge, uh, Malcolm Gite, chief among them. There are also some important essay volumes, Romanticism Comes of Age in 1944, Rediscovery of Meaning, 1977. Romanticism Come to, Comes of Age was republished in 66, and uh, this bit was sort of taken out. But in the 44 edition, there's some really interesting commentary on um, how his experiences of romantic poetry led him to the idea of the Christian uh, incarnation. Um, so if you are interested in, in that relationship, that's definitely a good place to uh, to look. Um, so that's that's it for his trajectory of critical works. Um, and you can see the timestamps kind of broken up between the kind of early, say, Oxford period, the the London um, solicitor period, and then uh, in America. And his creative works follow a similar kind of trajectory. So the first big work is The Silver Trumpet in 1925. Uh, in many ways, this is the first fantastical effort by an inkling. So really important. Hugely popular with Lewis, Tolkien, and crucially, their their children. One interesting thing I'll note about the physical text of the silver trumpet uh, is that the, the sound of the titular trumpet is printed as if it were dancing about the page, uh, which might remind us of some of the structural innovations we see in, in poets like E.E. E. Cummings or Apollinaire. There's a lot of that in Barfield's imaginative works and critical works, where he, he does the kind of innovation that we we associate with someone else, kind of uh, contemporary or further down the line, more mainstream. Um, there's almost just sort of this this whole other other history of innovation that's happening um, in in Barfield. So when you're talking about the physical text and the sound of the trumpet is printed as though it was dancing on the page, do you mean as in music notation, as in drawing of sound waves? Uh, yeah, as in the actual, there, there's no staff or anything, but it's, it's almost, yeah, precisely that as if it's kind of a uh, musical notation out in, out in thin air. And so Barfield was one of the first people to ever do that in a book? Uh, no, there were, there were precedents for it, but, um, it was one of the things that sort of in serious poetry, when we think of, uh, that kind of structural innovation, we think of probably either E. Cummings or Apollinaire. I think a lot of structural innovations and in sort of high modern poetry you can trace back to nursery rhymes like gerard manley hopkins for example he's not a modernist poet but he's thought of as being a poet during this period kind of takes a lot of his his, his metrical patterns from nursery rhymes and uh, kind of does it seriously so i mean it, it's still a children's story but this is uh silver trumpet is, is still a serious book i think it's valuable to consider um, Barfield's sort of seemingly just playful innovations. And, and again, he's not the first to do this, but he's one of the first people to to use innovations like this in a, in a really serious, uh, fantastical text. He was an early adopter. Right, right. But only two years later, Barfield turned from fantasy to English people, his serious novel project. Uh, Barfield wrote to Lewis about this text in 1927, saying... I need your prayers just now. I have embarked on a really long and complicated novel. Parts of the original manuscript are now lost, and the book awaits proper publication. Um, but my, my prediction is that Barfield studies turns more and more to English people in the years to come. But uh, after English people, uh, Barfield's writing slowed for a few years as he began his career as a solicitor in London. Uh, so the next important text was only in, uh, written in 1937, um, the verse drama Orpheus. Uh, it was first performed in 1948 and only published in 83. Uh, but it's an adaptation of the great classic. And Orpheus is, you know, one of the most adapted stories in history. But what's interesting about Barfield's version is how uh, the character of Orpheus is conflated with Barfield's other principal influences from English literature. So 
Here's a short quotation from the second act that can demonstrate this. So speaking at once to a sort of diegetic audience of, of animals, uh, as well as to the literal audience, the character Orpheus sings, Dear friends who come to help me ease my pain with your presence, say what can I do? You have saved me from madness. They cannot answer me, save with my voice. It is their bridge. I will sing to them again. So this scene, and we might say it's a uh, meta-theatrical pun, speaking of the, the bridge, the voice, I think interestingly invokes characters like Shakespeare's Prospero, um, right, the speech at the end of The Tempest, as well as Coleridge's Mariner, who finds himself likewise impelled to repeat his tale. But it's been performed a few times recently, and I think we'll see Orpheus recur more in the decades to come here. A little voice at the back of my head is saying that Lewis actually suggested that he do this. He was the one that suggested that he try adapting it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, a lot of their projects are, are due precisely to the, um, the encouragement of one another. This is why uh, yeah, Narnia has all of the, the, the dedication, the Barfield and so on, right? So after he writes Orpheus, the big thing that Barfield does creatively is what's referred to as the Burgeon Trilogy. This is Ever Diverse Pair, published 1950, followed by Worlds, Worlds Apart and Unancestral Voice, all written during and often about uh, his experience as a solicitor in London. The main character is described as uh, aesthetically, though not necessarily psychologically schizophrenic, and that his mind is split between Burgeon, the creative force, and Burden, who deals with the Kafkaesque absurdities and, and mundanities of modern life. Uh, this is simultaneously a critique of modern society, as Barfield saw it, as well as a very literal staging of Coleridge's distinction between imagination and fancy. For Lewis fans, I think Ever Diverse Pair is the book to read. Uh, there's a whole chapter dedicated to real-life exchange with Lewis, and the gist is that uh, Lewis just used to donate his money literally before he even received it. He would write to the publisher and say, I found this charitable cause for the money there. And he found himself in the situation where, since the money was never in his hands, he hadn't even realized he had to pay royalties, uh, or sorry, uh, taxes on the royalties for his books. So he comes to Barfield saying, I have to pay you know, 2,000 pounds in royalties, but I have no money. I've given it all away. So uh, Barfield, as solicitor, helps him through this. And the whole chapter is, is transparently... And he has sort of this footnote saying this is sort of exactly what happened with with Lewis and me. It's it's a heartwarming uh, account, and and indeed Lewis was very involved with this whole trilogy. Uh, he says of I think of Worlds Apart, uh, his compliment slash, slash criticism is that uh, the book made me read it too quickly, uh, suggesting that. Which which is sort of a double compliment because on one hand he's saying I loved it, I ate it up. But there's there's kind of an embedded criticism because he, he thinks that Barfield is is at times an overly dense writer. There's a lot of philosophy going on. So uh, he thinks there's a way in which the style of the narrative is unsuitable to the, the content. Lewis thinks that there's a lot of things that would be better treated in a philosophical treatise uh, than, than something like a novel. And Lewis also picks at things like uh, Barfield writes polyvalence instead of multivalence. He uses words transitively that should only be used intransitively or, or vice versa J just little things i mean it's all, it's all playful they they're great friends uh but they were very fond of of criticizing each other in this way oh absolutely i've heard stories about the inklings meetings i think in warney's diary he says if outsiders saw our meetings and they didn't know that we were friends they would think that that we were at war with one another right your description of this ever diverse pair I haven't read it, but when you're contrasting the uh, the creative life and the mundane modern life, it actually reminds me of Tolkien's short story, Leaf by Niggle, because I've, I've heard people interpret that as showing the, the tension between Tolkien's uh, desire to be a creative and to <laughs> get stuff done otherwise outside of his legendarium. Right. That's a great point. But also Lewis's criticisms about the form and the content not really suiting one another. I kind of felt that way when I read Eager Spring. Mm. 
Owen's grandson, last time we were back in England, we met up at a pub and he gave us a, a new copy of Eager Spring. And my wife and I read it and we loved the writing, but it did seem like a couple of books stuck together. And there was a bunch of pages in the middle, just plugging anthroposophy, just stuffed in a in a, what seemed, a seemingly very odd place that seemed rather out of context from the rest of the book. I'm sure he saw the continuity of thought, but it, it felt like several different books taped together. Right. Yeah. To the, to the least by nickel point, uh, I, I'm really interested in Coleridge's legacy. So I, I think you're exactly right to bring that up. That's definitely an instance where I think Barfield is channeling Coleridge and talking to Tolkien about it. And that's, that's probably what inspired um, uh, the text. And uh, yeah, Eager Spring is an exciting text. I, I appreciate there are a number of readers who, and this is precisely what's going on with Lewis, are going to want to table what Barfield's doing with anthroposophy in favor of ex experiments with Neoplatonism, the imagination, the incarnation, and so on. So the tendentious criticism is a common one. This is nothing against his anthroposophical work, of course. Uh, the thing I want to communicate and what Lewis was eager, eager to communicate was that there's something in Barfield for everyone. Superb. Well, let's move from talking about Barfield's literature to his poetry. Until I began preparing for the season, I actually hadn't quite realized that Barfield was a poet, which I now realize was a bit dumb, particularly considering my knowledge of the Inklings and the proclivities of all of Barfield's friends. But anyway, can you talk to us a little bit about Owen Barfield, the poet? Right. Well, Barfield was known amongst the Inklings as the philosopher. And even though he placed huge stakes in his own poetic works, they really didn't find the kind of success his critical writings did. So your not knowing about his poetry is not an oversight uh, by any means. It's rather a reflection of relatively meager publication history. But luckily, the history of Barfield's lack of poetic publications uh, is itself fascinating, mostly because the editors who rejected his work were important figures in their own right. The most famous example involves Barfield's submission of some early poetry, so from the 1920s, among them his long poem, The Tower, uh, to Criterion, New Criterion, which was received and rejected by T.S. Eliot. The criticisms Eliot sends back to Barfield about his poems are vague. He says in response to one poem, for example, quote, I do not feel you have quite reached the necessary point, though I hardly know why, end quote. <laughs> That's not helpful. <laughs> right. And, and indeed, later in his life, reflecting on this editorial rejection to, I think, Walter de Lamar, um, Eliot says he considered Owen Barfield an artist, quote, too valuable to let go, a poet destined to make his mark in the long run, and yet, and here speaking in an editorial capacity, difficult to sell. Uh, but Eliot's prediction about making his poetic mark in the long run is really finally coming to term. Parlor Press in the U.S. has just published an exciting volume featuring the long poem The Tower alongside other poems and plays. The volume's introduction features, among other resources, a great survey of Lewis's definitely varying attitudes towards Barfield's verse. But perhaps most exciting for your purposes is uh, what you'll identify as the Narnian language that shoots through a lot of his poems. In some cases, this is Lewis influencing Barfield. In other cases, as with Barfield's big banister character, we have evidence of Owen Barfield inspiring Lewis. Uh, materialized in that instance as the name of a student in, in the silver chair. Uh, but I, I will read a quick snippet from the tower that I think you'll find exciting. Uh, the relationship to Lewis is transparent. Uh, the passage is early in the poem. Uh, it takes the form of an, an ekphrasis, so sort of a bit of, of poetry about a work of art upon an imaginary tapestry. Uh, so it runs like this. Two children were out in a wide city when the snow, already fallen, made the dark night blench. I'll pause here on this word blench. Barfield loves words that trace back from Old English through Germanic, again, as in uh, history and English words, to some Indo-European prototype. And when we trace blench like this, we, we find that it, it, it can mean to recoil out of pain. Uh, but it's also etymologically linked to blanch, to make white. Mm. So... Uh, the dark night blenches. Uh, Barfield has the, the, the snow makes a dark night uh, recoil uh, figuratively. And then uh, this is in the process of more literally whitening it. So it's like a philological pun. 
<laughs> Precisely. Uh, the Catholic poet Jared Manley Hopkins does this all the time, too. I think that this kind of linguistic suspension is is, is doing something important uh, in their poems. But if you do read Barfield, uh, one fun thing to do is if you find a word and think that's, that's kind of strangely placed, go to the Oxford English Dictionary, kind of trace the etymology, and it's always a rich experience. But so much for Blench. Uh, I'll resume. And falling still, caress him with shy touches until they, wandering onward hopelessly, came to a lion, figured huge in stone, and entered magically, a cavern throat found red and warm inside and soft with life. Then, by mysterious inward climbings, were high on the narrow plinth that cop- topped the column above their lion. And among chill stars sailing the sky in a perilous bark of stone steered by a statue. But the years had lent interior meaning to those baby pictures, the white snow, the red gorge, the chiseled stone, and the straight column tapering in the dark. So a lot going on about what he thinks about um, art, myth. You've clearly got this Aslanic figure. Hmm. That's beautiful. I heard from Malcolm Geit, who you actually mentioned earlier, he said that Lewis, when he wrote poetry, he comes off as very Barfieldian. Uh, and the example that he gave was Lewis's poem, The Adam at Night, where Lewis is describing an unfallen Adam during his, his first night. And it alludes to an idea that we've touched on so far this month about original participation. Exactly. Malcolm is a tremendous reader of the Inklings, and I think he's right to identify that as a moment of reciprocal influence. There's also a fair bit of Barfield and Tolkien and the other Inklings uh, but that's another discussion altogether. I know you have Professor Rob Coons on next, uh, so I'll, I'll look forward to learning from that. Mm, yeah, it's going to be great. And there's a link with Tolkien that I didn't know before. You said that Barfield loved tracing words back to particularly Germanic roots, and that seems to be what Tolkien is all about with Rohan. Mm. Yeah, I've uh, I've heard um, Professor Coons speak before, and... Uh, I, there's a, a famous passage in, in The Hobbit, which is often taken as Tolkien sort of very transparently citing Barfield. So I'm, I'm sure that will that will come up in exciting ways. Wonderful. Jake, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Uh, you've given us a tour of Barfield's literature and his poetry. And uh, just to recap, what were the books that you think a Lewis fan uh, would be best to read first? Good question. I think the thing to go through for... First, if you're interested in his critical or philosophical writing, is poetic diction. Uh, it really has the seeds of, of everything he has to say. Barfield is referred to, and indeed refers to himself, as, as a, a thinker of one thought, this being the history of consciousness, which is not at all to say that he doesn't have a lot to say about a lot of things. Um, but a lot of this comes from poetic diction originally. Um, it is the text that is probably most influential on, on Lewis and the other Inklings. So um, I, I would say that for the um, creative, uh, for the critical works. For the creative works, I, I would turn to this ever diverse pair and perhaps the, the long poem, The Tower. You can scroll through the uh, owenbarfield.org site and there's some description of a lot of texts and it, it, it should be obvious how uh, they relate to, to Lewis in some pretty exciting ways. And if people wanted to dip into his poetry for the first time, best recommendation? The thing to look to there is Parlor Press's new 2021 publication, uh, The Tower, Major Poems and Plays. Uh, the, the Tower being the great long poem that Barfield wrote that Eliot rejected. Uh, but Tower is also, Lewis speaks of Barfield as being this great thinker who, who towers over us all. So there's, there's kind of two things going on there. <laughs> I wonder how much Barfield's rejection by Eliot colored Lewis's own thinking about Eliot. It's funny, I, I haven't read any of Eliot. The only thing I know is that he and Lewis were not always the greatest fans of each other. <laughs> right. I mean, Eliot sort of shoots to success as, as the high modernist uh, poet. And for as much success as Lewis enjoyed w- with the rest of his work, uh, he was really not seen as a, as a tremendously successful poet himself. <laughs> so yeah, there's definitely some, some competition embedded there and we will be fixing that later in this season because we're going to have a poetry month and uh, i think we might have to have a little bit of barfield now as well if people want to find out more about you where can they go uh 
Yeah, I don't have much of an online presence, so I suppose, I suppose the best location is on my page on the website of the Cambridge Faculty of Divinity. Um, I have some publications on Barfield forthcoming, and they should be linked up there once they're in print. And one final question. Are there any publicly available pictures of Frodo wagons? Yes. My my wife and I have an Instagram account called Los Gres, L-O-S-G-R-E-S, and, and Frodo features there frequently. I will place links in the show notes. Thanks again to Jake Greffenstedt for being on the show today. And also thanks to all of our top tier supporters on Patreon, Gary, Jake, Stephen, Matt, Jeff, Chris, John, James, Kate, and Rowdy. As always, Pints with Jack t-shirts are available on our website, pintswithjack.com. And as we mentioned, next week, Barfield Month is going to continue with Dr. Rob Coons. And he's going to be talking about Tolkien, Barfield, and Neoplatonism. How metaphysics molded Middle Earth. And so join us then when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.